Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Hope Strategy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Corey Blake, along with Josh Daimley. What's up, man? Hey. I'm going to go back and listen and see how many times I say that exactly word for word the same way. <laughs> and how and many how times, many times I say, hey. <laughs> <laughs> man, what a, what a great conversation we had today with Colby and Mackenzie Bauer. A little background on them. They started Thread Wallets in January of 2015, shortly after getting married. So they've got a very unique story of pretty much having a business venture together since they got married, since they were dating, actually. It was uh, their they, first baby, right? Yeah, their first baby. There you go. That didn't come up, but you're exactly right. They started their company after noticing a need in the marketplace for slim wallets with style. Thread Wallets was born out of a need for expression. Together with their team, they have brought to life a category saturated with bulky and boring. Their purpose is to offer functional products that allow you to do what you love and look good doing it. Through their experiences as entrepreneurs, they have found a deep love for helping others chase their own passions and business dreams. They love working and creating together, but more importantly, they love hanging out with their two young daughters, Ray and Scotty. Myself, personally, I don't know any other entrepreneurs that have started a very, very successful e-commerce business hand in hand from when they very first met, basically. They were talking about entrepreneurship from early, early on. That was fascinating. It'll be interesting to see how this works out in the long run, right? I mean, maybe this is like a key part of their relationship and without the business, like who knows what would happen. <laughs> oh, that ate my funny bone for some reason. Hopefully they'll, we don't they'll have to keep, they'll have to keep this one going or if they ever sell this, they're going to have to like immediately start another business. Otherwise <laughs> they'll be like, now we don't know what to do with ourselves. Maybe we don't, we always, don't know how to see our relationship without the context of yeah, a business. Maybe they've always got multiple backup businesses just in case. <laughs> They started the business when they started dating. Since then, they've grown. I think he said since the second year, they've grown like 3,000%. He said yesterday they did more in sales than they did the first six months they were open. So they, they've grown a ton. They have relationships with a bunch of big brands and a lot of cool influencers. They're in a lot of different stores. And it's been fun for me. I've, I've known these guys for a while and to watch them continue to grow. But the remarkable thing is that they've done it continuing to learn and grow. And Colby himself, you know, he jumped into some quite some pretty significant personal issues that he's dealt with, with a, an addict mother and how that's affected their marriage and their partnership as the business has grown. And again, how they found hope through all of that. So anyways, it's, I love these stories, man. So many different ways to skin a cat, as they say, and we're getting so many cool conversations with different people doing different things, all finding hope in the process. It's been awesome so far. One thing I loved was that their product, their wallets, they're not really competing against all the other wallets that are out there to be the lighter, better, thinner wallet necessarily. But he brought up how they're kind of competing against rubber bands. Like if you don't want a big bulky wallet and you're just sticking all your cards together with a rubber band, well, here's something that's a little bit better and nicer than that. It's kind of the whole Clayton Christensen innovators dilemma type thing coming at it from non-consumption versus trying to be better than all the stuff that's already out there. I liked that angle. Yeah. It, and it's worked. It's worked really, really well. And I see their wallets everywhere. I mean, down here in Arizona, they're a big deal. Everybody's got them, whether it's keychains or the wallets, or they've got a bunch of other products. They mentioned that they're going to be releasing some new products here in the next 30 days, which is exciting. And their approach of disrupting a very boring space is something obviously you have some experience with as well, but a lot of that's kind of what entrepreneurs are looking for is a, you know, they said in, in that intro, you know, they, they innovated boring and bulky, right. And put a style and lifestyle brand into something that everybody needs. And it's worked out so well for them. It's been, it's been, like I said, super fun to watch. Yeah. So great conversation with them. So many lessons to learn for anybody that's looking to fortify their relationship, their marriage, build a business, talked a lot about the, the, some of the tough times and some of the big decisions and big, big wins that they've seen. And again, just a, just a gem of a conversation with a lot of gold in it. So yeah. Any other thoughts before we get to the episode, Josh? I think, well, you know, the one follow-up question that I didn't ask that now I wish I would have was just if a young married couple came to them six months married and said, Hey, we're going to start a business together. I wonder what their advice would be. I mean, I think we can pick up a lot of hints throughout the conversation, but it would have been interesting to get their direct answer on that. If they'd be like, don't do it. If they'd be like, <laughs> yeah, you know, make it happen. My gut says that they would say make it happen after that conversation, but I guess Probably. you never know. Probably. They're pretty positive yeah. people. Yeah. 
Yeah. I talked a lot about gratitude as well. That kind of came up just a natural evolution of the conversation. I could hear it in their tone and in their voice and in their stories that gratitude played a really critical role to the successes that they've seen. So I guess uh, if there's nothing else, Josh, without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Colby and Mackenzie Bauer of Thread Wallets. Something is happening in our world. Time is very precious. I'm going to show you how great I am. Hope in the face of difficulty. More than machinery, we need humanity. Hope in the face of uncertainty. I'm better now than I was. I'm experienced now. Changing the world can happen anywhere and anyone can do it. The audacity of hope. This is the Hope Strategy Podcast with Corey Blake and Josh Steinle. We appreciate you guys taking the time. I know that I have heard from you guys multiple times about who you guys are and what you stand for, but then also how you started Thread and, you know, the kind of the road that it's taken to get to where you are now. And since you are entrepreneurs who are also a married couple who run a business together, who it's not like one of you is doing it and the other one's, you know, off from the distance watching, you guys are both very actively engaged with roles at a growing company that you've scaled over the last, how many years now? Four or five, six years? Yeah. Six years. It goes by fast. So I want to get to know you guys a little bit. So tell us how you met. I think it was through college or something, but walk us through kind of how you guys met. I was over at BYU Hawaii in my senior year. So I was just about to graduate and Colby came over to play soccer. So he, this was in 2013, the end of 2013. Back in the good old days when BYU Hawaii had soccer. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So Colby was playing soccer and I was just over there finishing up school and we had a handful of mutual friends over there that kept trying to introduce us. They were like, Mackenzie, you've got to meet Colby Bauer. Like you guys would be perfect for each other. I remember um, one friend in particular just being like, you guys are both the happiest people I know. Like you need to meet each other. But I'd just gotten out of a pretty toxic relationship. So, and I was graduating and going to be leaving the island. So I was like, yeah, I'm not really into, into like starting a relationship right now. That's not where I'm at in like headspace. Graduated, moved back to Provo, and unbeknownst to me, Colby had also moved back to Provo after his first semester at BYU Hawaii because he was elite athlete who was <laughs> given preferential treatment in the sense that they allowed him to bounce back and forth between BYU Provo and BYU Hawaii to play soccer during both seasons. They they are different seasons, and one's NCAA and one's club. So he was able to do it. So he moved back to Provo. I moved back to Provo. And one of those mutual friends came and stayed with me for a little bit while she was visiting Utah. So she was with me and a couple nights that she was here, she was like, I'm going to go hang out with Colby Bauer. Like you should come. So our paths crossed in a big group setting for the first time ever really. And I thought he was like a cute cute kid. I was like, Oh like, yeah, I, I really like, he, he was fun. We played. <laughs> cute kid. Like, well, I wasn't, I just didn't like really. Yeah. Really love at first sight. It wasn't, no, it was just like, Oh, he's cute. Like I would get to know him more. He was fun. We played cards against humanity. Like he was witty, but the friend that was staying with me was like, I think I'm going to hook up with Colby tonight. And I didn't know Colby at all. So I was like, okay, well, she thinks she's going to hook up with him and he's that type of guy that I'm not interested at all. So really it was just like another passing thought, like, okay, cool. And then about two to three weeks later, I ran into him. I was with a friend, just me and my friend Maggie at yogurt land, the person right in front of us in line all by himself at yogurt land was Colby Bauer and we had interacted only enough that I didn't I honestly can even remember like I was like I know him and then I was like oh my gosh yeah that's that Colby kid they didn't have that but my friend had told me that so much was riding on that Colby good choice (laughs) yeah so anyway I we were the only three people in yogurt land so of course we started talking and it was a really fun conversation didn't think anything would come of it we left to go our separate ways And as we were leaving, my best friend, Maggie, who's known me for years, was like, how long have you known Colby? And I was like, I don't know him. Like, honestly, the first conversation one-on-one that we've ever had. 
And she was like, oh my gosh, you guys are perfect for each other. Like just within those 15 minutes, like you need to get to know him. And it was like angels from above, like the clouds split. It was like, <laughs> oh, like you need to get, like it finally clicked. It was like, if I have had so many friends telling me that I need to get to know him, I should get to know him. And fate pushing you together multiple times across oceans. Yeah. Finally it slapped you in the face. We had separated, gone to our cars and I turned around and like walked up to him in the parking lot. And I was like, Hey, we should hang out sometime outside of this. So I got his number and I went to California for the weekend. Um, I don't think we texted or anything, but when I got home, I hit him up and I was like, Hey, let's do something. Um, it'd be fun to get together. Let's go grab yogurt land again or something. And he told, texted me back and was like, yeah, that sounds so awesome. I've got a class tonight. So I'll text you when I'm done with my class. I was like, sweet. I was really excited. You know, I got ready for the night and I was like, this is gonna be fun. I'll put like, just kind of starting to put myself out there again after having been in this bad relationship don't hear from him and I'm pissed. I'm so mad I'm like I put myself out there I told my parents that I was going so then I felt stupid because my friends also knew and didn't hear back from him next day didn't hear back from him next day didn't hear back from him and I was like oh my gosh he is a typical promo boy he's making out with some other girl right now and I was just like uh, notching his you know like a like, oh, not not, not, <laughs> not, but not a notch in your bed. It's like a casual, like, first conversation, notch in your bed. Yeah. So he, um, let me tell this perspective. Okay, you tell okay. this. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we might need to tap into Colby's perspective here. <laughs> yes, thank you, Corey. Uh, there's a different side of the story, which I was just as offended. So I, I go to text her on Tuesday night after my class, and I'm all hyped on the date as well. And I hear no response. So I'm, again, I'm also hurt throughout that week. No, but you. What you heard was no. You said that's you, true. You said I you did hear back. I did hear back, and I heard no, just straight out. No, I was like, oh, oh brutal. I was pretty short, right? Yeah. So then I'm going throughout that week. I'm thinking, should I you try like next Tuesday? So anyways, next Tuesday arrives, and I'm like, okay, I'll just invite her. And so I go, and I'm looking for her number, and I hadn't saved it. But I had recently been talking with another girl. It was for a project. She was a married woman that was sewing some of our uh, product that I was making for class, right? And I hadn't saved her number either. So I'm going through the text and I see two 801 numbers and I click into one of them and it was the seamstress girl. And I see my invite for <laughs> yogurt land to this married girl. Oh right? my God. And, I, and now I'm realizing, crap, like I accidentally texted the seamstress married woman to ask, you know, go on, go on a date, date and she just flat out said, no, and now I'm understanding why. <laughs> good for and her. I, good oh, for her. Yeah, okay. So I immediately screenshot of that and, uh, and then text Mackenzie found her number, text her and said, you won't believe me, but here's a screenshot for proof. Like this is what happened. Anyways, long story long. <laughs> long story very long. We hung out that night. We went and got food and then we were with each other every yeah, single day. It was that. just, yeah. So out. that is how we met. Okay, I'm curious though. Like, how'd you work that out with the seamstress and her husband? <laughs> well, what was funny to me is that she didn't say like, "No, thank you. I think you have the wrong number." It was like she legitimately thought that he was asking her on a date. Yeah. It was like, "No, I'm good," or something like that. It was yeah. Like, yeah, just no. Which, like, <laughs> like no thought. explanation, just no. Yeah, that was a pretty awkward one for me, but I think the the way I worked it out was just I never texted her again, and she never texted yes. me again. <laughs> <laughs> oh to the, God, so until this day, she thinks you asked her out. Yeah, exactly. day, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she has this. She has this secret that she thinks she's hiding from everybody. Yeah, that, right. guy, that guy, that forty under forty guy over there, asked me out on a date <laughs> when I was married. <laughs> So I saw somewhere that you had kind of said, look, we're not ever going to get married until we've, until we've dated for a year. I don't know if it was that for each other or a rule that you had made, you know, for whoever it is that you started dating, but you actually ended up getting married after six months. Is that right? Six months of when all this started? Yeah. yeah. Well, How'd I was, that go down? I was headed out to my, for my last semester at BYU Hawaii. And I brought it up to my dad about either did like a, a relationship overseas or have Mackenzie come out to Hawaii and we would just still be dating until we like felt ready to get married. And he was like, absolutely not. Like you guys in Hawaii together in swimsuits, like you guys, that's just, 
and you're not married, that's just going to end badly. And I was like, so what do you recommend? He's like, well, my, wh- why don't you just try to get married before you leave? And that was kind of shocking from my dad. So I was like, kind of had his approval, you know? And for, for me, that was like one of the big things that was hinged on was like, do I have my dad's approval? And uh, when he said that, it kind of like, so I started to consider that and, and feed that. So then pretty immediately I brought it up to Ken's. We went on a walk and she was all for it. So we ended up getting married right before we left. And then literally the next day after our honeymoon, we, we flew out to Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, really quick. And it was truly against something like something that went against everything that I preached, like the previous relationship that I'd been in that was like, that I'd mentioned that had been pretty toxic was like two years And so I really was under the impression that if I were to marry someone, I would date them for a long time. Um, But that relationship, I dated for him for a significant amount of time and it didn't go anywhere. So with Colby, the conversation that we had was that time necessarily doesn't equate to experiences. So within the short period of time, Colby and I knew each other. We had, we kind of experienced a lot together in terms of, life experience his mom is an addict so there were experiences that we faced with you know challenges with that that we faced he had broken his arm didn't have family close at the time and so he stayed at my house with my family and like really got to know them while he was still hyped up on medication (laughs) so there were just certain things that like happened to us within those first few months of um, dating that just really solidified the fact that like, okay, this is right. And just comparing it to previous relationships we've both had, it was such a stark difference of how we both felt and interests we had and goals and priorities that we had for our lives that it just made sense. When you know, you know, right? People say that all the time, but it's totally true. I, I had no sure. idea what that meant until <laughs> I was like, how do you know? Like, how do you really know? And then I met Colby and I was like, probably within, I mean, I told you that we were with each other every day. So yeah. in a very short time, I was like, I'm, I know I'm gonna, this is who I'm going to marry. Yeah. It was kind of funny in that like single stage when you would see just friends just kind of drop off like they're yeah. around and then they're just not because they found the person they want to spend every waking hour with. And you're like, all right, well, see you yeah, later. I'll Another one falls. Later. Yeah, yeah. See you never. <laughs> it sounds like you have a pretty good mentor relationship with your, with your dad. Why was his approval so critical to you? That's a really good question, actually. Uh, relationships have changed, you know, over the last few years, I would say. But yeah, definitely growing up, I held a lot of weight in his decision or approval. He's always been supportive with whatever I've done, whether that be soccer or church or skateboarding or business, whatever it is. Like he, he loves supporting me. I think he just loves me, you know. Colby's biggest cheerleader. He was the reason for the re- the reason I got into entrepreneurship was because in a short story, I was on a plane with my buddy and we were just on the way back about to land and we started drawing up some pictures of things to put on t-shirts and we just kind of were brainstorming just like any 14 year old kid would want to do is just like a t-shirt and hat brand right and we were really into wakeboarding so he was kind of influenced by that and my dad said well why don't you actually put these into production and start selling them and I didn't really think of it as like this could actually be a business but he really pushed that and like helped me open my eyes to the fact that it could, it could actually turn into something. So he helped set up an LLC and we got a screen printer going and we got it into a bunch of local surfs and skate shops and boutiques. And, um, it turned into a small business through high school, but that was my first venture. And it really <laughs> helped me and my, and my dad really ha- helped me get into that. Another venture right after my mission, I got back and I thought of an app that I wanted to develop as you know, apps are extremely expensive. And so my dad said, well, pitch me on the idea and maybe I'll, I'll back it for you. So he had me put together a deck and I'll do the whole thing, you know, very formal way of presenting. And then he gave me $20,000 to launch this app and I created something. And he's always been like that. And so for me, he held a lot of weight. I've always been intrigued by entrepreneurship, but he's also, he's a financial advisor and he had pretty, pretty much set up his practice to have me take over. So I was like on this, in this fork in the road, when I was graduating, whether I go and do financial management or do I pursue this just entrepreneurship? And 
I remember thinking this like really torn decision because on one hand you're sitting, sitting on a gold mine, you know, my dad had set it up perfectly and he's like, here's the shovel. Like it's right here. And then on the other hand, my instinct or my, I guess by nature, I, I like going after my own gold mine and I like the journey of finding that, discovering it or, or you know, and, and doing that. And so I, I expressed that to him and he's like, no, just go ahead. Then do your, do your thing. And so again, when, when I had that approval, that's when Mackenzie and I really felt like we were actually going to go into thread and pursue it hard. But before then I really had my mind set on financial planning because that's just what my dad did. So yeah, I don't know. I just, he's been with me, you know, like Mackenzie mentioned my dad, my mom's an alcoholic and a drug addict. And so she wasn't as present through my life, but he was, and he's always been that rock for me. He's always been supportive and, you know, every soccer game and coached me in baseball, the list goes on. But, um, that's, I think why I looked up to him so much. Man, that's irreplaceable, right? That, that type of relationship, especially when there's so much uncertainty around you with that type of, I had a very similar upbringing myself. And so, and with a dad who had custody and with a mom with the exact same situation, so much uncertainty around you, especially as a kid growing up, that type of solid foundation and kind of that thing you can fall back on that relationship. In this case, the relationship with your dad, it might be a relationship with a mentor of other, you know, or a mom or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I experienced that man. And, and I know to this day, when I talk to my dad about, he'll, he'll bring up like the, he's brought it up so many times, like the biggest regrets were like two, the only two baseball tournaments he ever missed, you know? And he, and now like as a dad to three kids and one on the way and and he was a single parent to four, you're like, man, like, how do you make it to everything? Like it's, yeah, it's, really. you know, and to think like, he's so upset that he missed two out yeah. of all of them, you know, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. So that's awesome. Man. Yeah. And so kids, you studied international culture studies and was it anthropology and communications or what? what was I it? did the peace study, peace building track. Okay. So you did the peace building. So, so you've got, people ask me this all the time and I don't have very many people that are entrepreneurs like I am that have started successful businesses like we have that also studied ICS, right? So it's, it's funny because people are like, wait, how, what did you study? Why did you study yeah. that? Oh, totally. What, all the time. So what was your, what was your process? I mean, you studied peace building, right? In, yeah. in college. And then you've become, you know, in this partnership with, with Colby, you've become a real successful entrepreneur and you learned a lot. I mean, did you ever see that coming? I think to give you a little background growing up, I don't think I've ever told Colby this story, but I shared it the other day with someone I loved the idea of starting my own something, whatever that was. I was kind of like a nerdy kid in terms of how I spent my time. Like I loved making jewelry or scrapbooking or like knitting hats, like just funny little things. Like I loved doing crafty, creative things. And I had so many little trinkets around my room that I'd made or handcrafted. And one of my little hobbies that I got in for a while into for a while was hat making. And I remember I would lay awake in bed at night thinking about how I could sell these hats and what I could do to build a little storefront for these stupid little hats that I was knitting. And I was like, I could like put my bracelets that I make and my hat, like all the little like handcrafted things that I did. I would sit thinking about how I wanted to sell them. There was an empty piece of property at the end of our street that I was like, what if I put a little like hut, you know, like built something there. Anyway, it was just so in my head. And I don't think I ever really knew how to start something or how to get traction towards an idea. But I always loved the idea of starting something on my own. I'm curious and I need, and I need to talk to people that aren't entrepreneurs about this because so many entrepreneurs that I talked to had that itch from the yeah. time they were little, whether it was making hats or selling candy bars or whatever, you know, lemonade yeah. stands and getting so stoked about it. I'm curious if that's something every kid goes through or if it's just because I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs who had the same Yeah, experience. Yeah, I would be interested in that too. Cause, and I remember in college, I, I had a blog that got, like it, I built a decent community off of it. Like I think if I had kept going with it, not being like, oh, I could be huge right now. But this was back when like blogger was really new blogging was the platform to share your thoughts and stuff because Instagram hadn't come out yet. 
Snapchat had not come out yet. Going and checking so, everybody's blogs to see what yes, family. Yeah, every morning I'd go what wake is. up and check the blogs of the people that I loved and I would have comments on mine. And I remember getting so excited about this little community that I was building and that faded out over time. But I remember, you know, brainstorming ideas about that and how to build a community through a blog. And these ideas would kind of come and go. But um, ultimately I found a joy and a love for what I studied, which was international cultural studies and emphasis in peace building. I loved what I studied. I loved the idea of helping people bridge the divides that they face in their lives, whether it be due to race or religion or family conflict, politics. I love bringing people together. I think that's part of my nature. Like I just really enjoy having people come together, building communities and just being social. And so I think that I, I felt a sense of that in what I studied, bringing people together, uniting people, giving people the same cause to unite on, finding commonalities. So I loved what I studied. When I graduated, I, I kind of tossed around the idea, okay, maybe I'll go to law school. I'll get my master's in conflict resolution. I can work for an NGO or a lot of big corporations will have an internal mediation team because mediation tends to be cheaper than litigation and going the legal route. But as soon as I met Colby, our first dates and discussions and conversations were spent around ideating business ideas. I even remember on our honeymoon waking up one morning and, or maybe it was going to bed one night and we just laid in bed talking about ideas in general. Like, okay, what about pacifier clips? What do like moms need? What do women need that they don't like? We just would always brainstorm ideas. And so I think what I have found is that the reason I love doing what I do now, which is marketing is there's a connection between what I studied with peace building and um, communication and how to find commonalities amongst different people's narratives with marketing. I see the um, similarities because you're, you're building communities, you're telling stories, you're finding ways to connect and unite people around certain causes or ideas or products. And so I think that that's how I found the passion for what I'm doing now. And I, I just love it. I love the building of a community, spreading awareness of an idea, a movement, that that stuff all really excites me. How my peace studies degree influences my life right now. Internally, like I said, it helps me know how to drive narratives. I think it's come in handy the past few months with the Black Lives Matter movement and how to navigate conflict and, okay, we need to post about this. How are we going to do so in a tasteful way? So there's certain things within our business that it really applies to. We've had our team read several of the books that I studied, The Anatomy of Peace and Leadership and Self-Deception. We require all of our employees to read Leadership and Self-Deception. I love that. And then another thing is just within our marriage. I'm definitely not perfect at it. And Colby oftentimes has to say, like when we get into conflict or disagreements, he has to remind me like, what would you do? Like, what would your studies teach you about this situation right now? And I'm like, <laughs> screw my studies. Like, I just want to yell at you. Like, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's interesting. It's been a different journey than I would have imagined, but it feels right. And I'm really grateful for it. I think that thread is something that brings us a lot of passion, but it gives us a platform to be able to bring change amongst our community and our employees and that's really what my studies were about is bringing change, bringing positive change into the communities around you. So I get that I question all the time as well, having studied the same thing. Right. And I remember, and, and maybe, maybe you had a class where you talked about this. I'm guessing you did, but where we talked a lot about like where people make their meaning. You remember that? Yes. And like narratives and stuff obviously tie into that. But I remember like for some reason that impacted me a lot. Like how do individuals, I guess, or where do individuals make their meaning, like their life's meaning? And every culture is different, right? They all create meaning in a different place, which then that's kind of the stimulus that has different responses, right? It, it, it affects the way that they behave, the way that they treat others, the way that they treat themselves, the way that they, you know, what their ambitions are, what their fears are, whatever, right? Like it all stems from this place of where their meaning is created. And I've seen that tie so closely into you know, like management skills and leadership skills with employees, really trying to understand where people make that meaning, but then also like really understanding 
what motivates people? What are the narratives, like you said, that they're telling themselves and how does that affect the decisions they make all stemming again from where they make their life's meaning? So yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It was, it was kind of a roundabout way to get there, but I know you obviously, and quite a few other entrepreneurs who studied the same thing. And I look up to all of them and it seems like they have kind of a lot of those same yeah. foundational. Well, principles. I think, I think it comes down to what we studied international cultural studies with an emphasis in peace building is about creating change. Entrepreneurship is the same. It's, you want to create change in some way. And so I think a lot of the big movers and shakers with political movements, social movements, they're entrepreneurs in their own way and then vice versa, right? Like business, business people, those who have that entrepreneurial mindset are entrepreneurial because they want to create change. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, uh, it's a superpower, right? And it's something that some people use for good and some people don't. And so it's, it's kind of fascinating to watch that when you kind yeah, of totally. understand how to tell a story and how to direct a narrative, you know, it can be used for good and it can also be used for not so good. So yeah. it's one of the things I love about thread doing it for good. So Kenzie studying international peace resolution stuff. Do you look at the world today and do you look at it and say, man, what a mess we've got here? I mean, is it depressing and then looking at the state of the world or do you feel hopeful looking at the world? It's interesting because I feel our world is very polarized and that depresses me. I think, oh my goodness, why can't we just come together? Like, why can't we look at these issues as, you know, here in the States, you've got the Republican Party, you've got the Democratic Party and a lot of issues are so polarized and it's like, for instance, global warming or environmentalism. To me, my opinion is that that should be an everybody issue. We should all want to make this world a better place. Um, you see examples of that with so many different um, policies or movements that are happening that I don't think they should be so politically charged. But those make me sad and those um, feel kind of depressing to me. But then I see at a smaller level, like at our community level and how many people are doing good and trying to spread light and bring hope to our community, whether that be through women empowerment or um, shedding light on small businesses or service projects that unite the community. Those things bring me so much peace. I think at the core, you know, everyone's just trying to do their best with what information they've been given. And so if you can look at things through that lens, I think it helps shed light on why the world is the way it is. There's so much information going around. There's so much that is hard to discern, whether it's true or false or right or wrong. And I think when you look, can look at it like, okay, everyone's just trying to make sense of the information they're given how can we come together? And oftentimes I think that starts, I think more often than not, it should start with at the individual level, within the home, within the community, within the state, and then move upwards as opposed to vice versa. But personal opinions are getting in there, but I, yeah, it's a very, we live in a very interesting world. And I just, I'm really proud of the friends and people that we've been able to connect with and the good that they're trying to do. Softball, easy question for you. <laughs> yeah. If you could invite everybody in the world to do one thing to bring about more peace in the world, what would it be? It's easier said than done, obviously, but to open your mind to different perspectives. Like I think that when you can say, okay, I am going to put myself legitimately, not just assume what that other person thinks, but I'm going to sit down and have a conversation with them and if I could tell everybody to find someone or reach out to someone and have a meaningful, deep conversation with them about the other person's life experiences, I think we'd all see things different, differently. We're really just, like I said, all trying to do the best with what we've been given. Yeah, see, I like that because I think everybody in the world does need to open their mind to my perspective and see that I'm right about everything. <laughs> I, I like where you're going with that. Yeah. <laughs> I love the answers there. And Josh, thanks for asking those questions. I think that that helps a lot. And, I, and it taps into some of that stuff that you studied in school, because sometimes it feels like <laughs> you studied a lot and who knows how much you use, you know, so it's kind of nice. Yeah. I, the one kind of going along the lines of what you were saying with just having those meaningful discussions, stealing from the seven habits of highly effective people, like any conflict that we have, there's been so many times at MWI where we've had a conflict 
you know, with a customer or internally within our team, um, where, you know, emotions get elevated and there's like this high stress and, oh my gosh, we're never going to figure this out. And then kind of using some of these tools that I've developed over the years and specifically, I mean, I tap into seven habits stuff all the time, but just seeking first to understand and then to be understood. Like what happens a lot of times is you, when you actually listen to somebody and hear their perspective, oftentimes by the time you're ready to speak, your, your perspective is completely changed because you actually listened. Right. And you make progress so much faster. And there's been so many calls where, um, where employees after or team members after or something have said like, Whoa, how did that deescalate so quick? How did we come up with a solution? And it's like, Oh, I just shut up and listen and it (laughs) tends to work itself out. Right. So anyways, I love that. That's, that's great. Great insight. Okay. So third wallet, there was a couple of iterations early and a couple of different ideas that were bounced around and then a Kickstarter was started. And then from there, we had other things that went down, but tell me, maybe Colby, tell me about the early stages and kind of the, the way that the idea came to be. And maybe some of those early ideas that turned out to not work out, but led you to Thread. Well, not many people know this, but Thread was actually started as a sock company. We, I played a lot of soccer, obviously. And so there was um, a niche in the market where similar to Stant Socks, there was in, in the soccer world, people were training with crew socks instead of knee high socks. Like you'd have your training socks and then you'd have your game socks. But when you go to train, you look at all these teams and you'd see everyone had a different pair. There was no uniformity amongst it. So we thought we could provide a really high quality performance sock for soccer teams that was unified with the team logo and all on it. So that was the initial idea. And then I had another idea and I'll tell you how they kind of married each other, but I had lost my wallet in the ocean in in Hawaii and I was looking for a wall online and couldn't find one. There was, or I couldn't find one that I liked anyway. You search on Google and it was just the same wallet pretty much with a different logo on it. It just a brown or black bulky bifold and that was it. And then I started to see some minimalist wallets on Kickstarter and really loved, loved the minimalism, but still it lacked expression. And so in the meantime, before I could find a wallet, I actually liked to buy, I was using a rubber band and I fell in love with the rubber band. The functionality was just slim. And and I thought I could create a better rubber band and really, and then stamp socks was really catching my eye at the time. Just the, just all the different art they were putting on socks. And I thought the way that they disrupted white socks, right? Yeah, White and black tube socks. They came in and said, no, let's make these a fashion statement. And you know, yeah, Totally. And that's what I thought the category of wallets was lacking was just that yeah. fun art and expression. So I started looking for ways to, to put art on an elastic band. So I found out a way there was a company out of Utah it's called Beloved and they were putting out, out shirts and all different products that had the weirdest crap on it. Like everything from a pepperoni pizza taking over your whole shirt or like a massive sloth face all over a shirt or something like that. And I was just so intrigued by the printing application of that. So I found out they were in Utah and I, I went to Joanne's fabric, grabbed some white elastic and took it to their headquarters and walked in and just asked them if I could try to print on it. One of the interns there was printing and I was like, do you mind if I try this? And he's like, sure. And I was like, dude, this could ruin, ruin the printer. Like, are you sure? He's like, dude, go ahead. And I was like, yes, I love you. They gave me a print of, you know, like a repeating pattern of the poop emoji. And so I printed on the elastic a bunch of poop emojis and it worked perfectly. And so I was like, whoa, like this is it. Like this is, that's where my eyes were open to this opportunity of printing all sorts of art on elastic. I found out that you could do the same thing on socks. So I was like, oh, sweet. So I, um, so I was like, we could get this printer, this way of printing and print all over the socks for our sock business. Well, to order socks, you had to have a minimum of, I think it was like 5,000 socks or something crazy. Maybe it's 500. And we didn't have the money for that. So we thought we could launch a Kickstarter for the wallet company or the wallet product, because that's just easy as going to buy a bunch of elastic at Joann's, you know, it was just an easy minimum. So anyways, the whole idea behind the first Kickstarter was let's raise enough money to get this printer so that we could do our sock business. Well, it turned out that the, while it wasn't a home run, our Kickstarter campaign raised only eight grand, but it was enough for me to realize that, there, there was a lot of opportunity in the wallet category more so than the sock category. 
And in that time, we had already placed an order for a bunch of white socks right after the campaign. And so we were still planning on, on going forward with socks until I, I started to really think about it and talk to my business partner at the time. And we decided that let's just cancel our order in China for those socks and let's move forward with wallets. I'm glad we did because you know, my instinct was right on the fact that it was just the sock category was overcrowded. We would have been competing against massive brands, Stant Socks being one of them. Anyway, so it went from socks to wallets and started out with a very simple product. Our flagship product was the elastic band. And we kept that as our only product for the first two, two, yeah, two, two and a half years. The elastic wallet with a ton of different designs on it, right? Like you guys right. were just... Yeah. And you, you see a lot of founders, you know, started in the garage, you know, or whatever. You guys started in Kenzie's bedroom with their sewing machine, right? Yeah. Well, actually, part of the story that never really gets told was before I had met Mackenzie, I had gotten a, like the smallest storage unit you could find. And I, we were working out of a storage unit. Um, I needed internet. So I had like those at the time your phone wouldn't do the whole, what is that hotspot? So I had to go buy one of those. And we were just working out of a storage unit. And then until I found, we, we started dating, then I said, we went into yeah, our we bedroom. moved everything into my childhood bedroom, just down the hall from my parents' room. <laughs> yeah. So the first Kickstarter did eight grand or 8,400 or something, right? Yeah. It gave you the vision for what could come and what, what could be and that hope, right? They say, oh, there's actually people interested in this that I don't know that aren't my mom and dad, right? Like yeah. People yeah. out there on the internet are saying, oh, I would buy that and I'm going to invest in it, which yeah. obviously gives you a huge vote of confidence. And then you started going to, and I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but so you had the Kickstarter realm of people saying, I like this, I'd buy it. But then you also started selling products person to person at farmer's markets, right? Correct. So yeah, that that timeline is perfect. So once we had this 1.0, which was just an elastic band with no no additional pockets, we decided to print off a thousand wallets before we got married and moved out to Hawaii and just try to sell them at stores in Hawaii and really kind of get them into retail stores. And we thought we'd sell through them, you know, pretty quickly, but it was close to the end of the semester and we had sold zero of them. And luckily there was a farmer's market on campus that was happening and it was leading up to the holidays. So it was perfect timing. So we took all of our wallets to this farmer's market and discounted them. Um, If you followed us on Instagram and Facebook, you got them for, I think it was like five bucks, five or $10. And so they started selling like hotcakes and the best part of that was, and I'd recommend to any entrepreneur is try to get as much face-to-face feedback as possible from people you don't know in a selling format. So we're actually putting a price tag on it and where they're willing to like put money down on it because that really opened my eyes. And I think that's where Mackenzie's eyes started to be opened on the fact that this could turn into something. Is your title CMO? Kenzie, you're chief, yeah. the chief marketing officer. So a C- CMO of an e-commerce business you're so zeroed in and clued in on, you know, click through rates and the cost per click of everything yeah. and your heat, your heat map analysis and your, you know, split testing things and all these things, right? Like it's all digital. It's all based on clicks of these people all over the world on the other side of a computer that you don't see right? Yeah. versus the in-person literal nonverbal, you know, cues that you're getting verbal cues that you're getting. Yeah, um, great. what, what was, what are some of the key differences there and how, Uh, How did that impact kind of the decisions you made after that, those farmer's markets? At that point, we were still kind of undecided what we were going to do with the rest of our lives. Colby had the option of playing professional soccer. He had the option of taking over his dad's financial firm one day, which he mentioned. Um, And then we had this little wallet idea or, you know, some, some sort of entrepreneurial venture. And we weren't exactly sure what that would look like. But being in front of these people face to face, we, we had a website and we would be shocked when there'd be like an order come in and we'd package it in our little apartment, like take one or two orders to the post office and mail them. And we were like, well, how did someone from Nebraska find out about us or something? Just random, random yeah. people. And it wasn't a lot. It was very minimal. But at these farmer's markets, it was just so validating. People talking about, oh my gosh, this print is so fun. I love this. Like my sister would love this. Oh, I'm going to buy these all as gifts and take them home for my family. Oh, you know, it would be cool if you added this. Or have you ever thought about a, a design like this? Like there was just so much feedback and our table would always just be like formed. Like people and sooner rather than later, they were, were all kind of all over campus. Like people just were carrying their cards in them. So that really was just 
it was just validating. Like there's such a difference. Selling online is amazing because you can reach people all over the world, but we still will do in-person events that are targeted towards our, the demographics we want to infiltrate, but it's just nothing can beat that face-to-face -face interaction and the commentary that you get those verbal and nonverbal cues about your product. Yeah. And in my experience, entrepreneurship is those little inklings of validation and hope built on top of each other over and over and over yeah. and over again. Recognizing those early little moments of, you know, that credibility or that validation that give you that inkling of hope, you know, if you miss those, then. Yeah. That on well, I remember like, I think maybe we'd sell 50 or, you know, whatever it was at these farmers markets, 50, 60, I can't remember the exact numbers, but then I remember going home to our little apartment and we'd get, you know, one or two orders randomly a day from people who knows where and just sitting down and being like, okay, we don't really know what we're going to do with our lives, but we got 50 orders at the last farmer's market and we're getting one to two orders a day. Like what if we could just find a way to get 10 orders a day online? If we could just sell 10 wallets a day online, that would make us 50, 60,000 a year. And like, that's enough for us to be okay. Like it's just us right now. So it was like, okay, I think, yeah, it was just totally validating. It was like, I think we could do that. I think we could reach 10 wallets a day. Yeah. So I was actually going to ask you that it's a perfect segue. Cause I was going to ask you, I, I know early on you guys said, we've got these other great options, right? Colby has the potential to go and be a professional athlete. You've got the other option to take over dad's business, which would obviously, you know, it sounds like you had built something very successful and it's kind of a no brainer, right? On the surface. Yeah. From what I remember and on my research, you guys gave yourself a timeline. You gave yourself six months, right? right? Which it seems to me like a logical thing to do to say, well, we've got this idea and we're seeing people interested in it, but it would be crazy just to like turn down these other options, right? So let's give ourselves a little bit of a runway. And I'm guessing, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm projecting a little bit, but I'm guessing, and you just mentioned like, if we could just do 10 a day, like you, you had to organize some pretty specific goals in that six month window in order to continue that validation process and continue to give yourself hope for, Oh yeah, let's, let's pass on all these great opportunities and just do this. What was, what was that process like? How, how, what benefits did you see from setting a time limit on yourselves? Well, we knew that Kickstarter platform was, was good. So we thought let's do another one and just change it up a bit. So we, we launched the 2.0 and the great thing about a Kickstarter campaign, whether, you know, the funding aside is it forces you to, um, it forces you to act within a timeline. So you you set a goal for launch. You have 30 days or however many, the duration that you set during the campaign. And then, so you, you're basically working on a timeline that's um, not just internal, like in your mind, it's, it's an actual timeline. And so that forces you to get things going really fast. And so we set, I think it was March is when we launched the second campaign and we started in January. So that, that was really quick. We said, let's try to get as much PR. Let's t reach out to all friends and family. Let's lock in an agency for advertising. Let's reach out to as many influencers and, and send out as much product as possible within those two to three months before launch. Because of that timeline, it forced us to, to act really, really fast. And we lucked out. We hit some gold on influencer marketing. We struck gold with the agency we ended up deciding to use the campaign again, wasn't a home run, but it was a lot better than the first one. It was, I think 31,000 or something 35, I think. or 35. And then we launched the website, I think like two days after the campaign. And within the first two days of launching, we hit around $16,000 in sales on our website. And so that was enough validation for us. Again, you know, we, we had set the six month goal, but I think we had already decided in three months after that, the six months rolled around and we were like, it was, a, it was just a no brainer hey, to answer your question. I would put, you know, a timeline on it, set goals. And if you can hit those goals within a certain timeline, that really forces you to really act fast. What, what role does gratitude play in your guys' success? It's, I would say like the big, one of the biggest aspects of our success we are very religious people and we believe wholeheartedly that God is our business partner in this venture. Every single day we are having conversations about how 
grateful we are that we started when we did influencer marketing was such a different landscape. Yeah, you struck gold on that. So it was a lot easier to get our hands in the products of people with fairly decent sized followings. We're grateful every day that we've been able to network with the people that we've networked with in order to build our team. There's just been so many instances where we just look at each other and go, this would not be possible if it weren't for God. Like there's no way that we could have accomplished what we've accomplished if it weren't for the fact that he's on our team. I think that trying to keep that attitude, obviously we're not perfect, but we try to keep each other in check all the time. And I think we do a fairly good job at it in just saying that this is not us and there's a bigger purpose for this. At the end of the day, like we're, we love creativity and we love creating wallets and it's fun, but the biggest and most fulfilling aspect of our business is being able to create jobs for our team members that bring them fulfillment, being able to provide for our family, being able to work hard and work together on something and have a unified goal. And every day there's just this immense feeling of gratitude that comes from being able to live the life that we're living and that it's all worked out so far, that so far things have been good and That's not to say we haven't had bumps in the road and trials along the way, but gratitude is the biggest part of it, I'd say. Yeah, to that point too, when things do go crazy, when crap hits the fan, so to speak, which it does and it has quite frequently, gratitude is the only way we we actually get through. The way I put it is there's more good happening in our lives than bad, especially if you're focusing and feeding the good. And that if you don't have gratitude, then those trials can put you on a whole different path. Whereas with gratitude, they just propel you or they, they at least get, get you the, give you the strength to, to keep moving in the right direction. Yeah. I was thinking about that as you talked. And I think a lot of the successful people that I know practice that type of gratitude, right. And, and recognize the bumps in the road, the trials, the, the tribulations that you'll face as opportunities for improvement in that moment. Like, man, I, I've got a lot to be grateful for. It just kind of gives you a different frame of mind to make decisions from, right? I don't know how in depth you want to get on numbers or percentages or whatever, but what type of growth have you seen since those early days of thread that we've talked about to now, you know, 2020, uh, halfway through the year? From the second year of business, we've seen over 3000% growth it's easy to double $1, right? (laughs) But yeah, we're pretty confidential now on numbers. You probably already know them though. We've seen dramatic growth, but at the same time, it's been responsible growth. And that's, we've never had to raise money. We do have a few lines of credit for just in case, but we've never actually had to dip too much into debt. And so it's growing at a fast clip, but, uh, but also not too fast where we're, where we're trying to keep up and maybe making wrong decisions. But yeah, it's been, pretty eye-opening. Basically in a nutshell, we made more money yesterday than we, than we did a half of a year the first year. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. That gives you an idea of like the growth. What are some of the biggest milestones when you think back to like this? I mean, you guys still have a long way to go and I know you've got a ton of cool things in the works, which we'll talk about, but what, when you look back over this entire journey thus far, this, you know, five and a half years, what are some of the biggest milestones that kind of are burnt into your memory of like, oh man, that moment that we did this or that time that that happened or when we heard from that person, you know, what, what are some of those? Oh dude, some of the people that I've recently been able to talk with are just people that I never would have thought, give me the time of day. Um, (laughs) Some of the guys that like, they're more business idols. They're not like celebrities that everyone would know, but um, Jeff Curl, the founder of Stance, Chad Denena, the founder of Nixon, um, Jason, the founder, founder of Brixton. These are all like my favorite. Yeah, those are awesome. Oh, brand, by the way, Sean Neff, the founder of Neff Headwear. The list goes on on founders and, and just business idols. And so those people would never give me the time of day if I hadn't built something, you know, and there's, there's value I can bring to them. That's why it even makes sense that we can get on a call or go to lunch. As an example, the industry that we're in, the surf, skate, snow industry is pretty like filled with legacy brands like Vans and Santa Cruz and all these big ones that you can, you know, and love. They're all founded on wholesale. So they are, they're in thousands of retailers across the world, but e-commerce is so new, you know, the last 
really five to eight years is where Shopify has really taken a stance and you've seen growth. These guys, these legacy brands don't really understand the game of e-commerce as much. And so that's where our advantage lies. Being an e-commerce native brand has really given us an edge on understanding how to roll out e-commerce. And so when I talk to these guys, they're not doing near as much as we are with e-commerce, surprisingly. You would think they would be, but they're not. And so that's where we can actually add value to them. And I think that's my philosophy on networking with quote air quotes around it is look for ways you can actually add value to someone as opposed to just try to take, take, take. So it's, we call the palms up approach, look to give as opposed to take. And so, yeah, that's, that's been a milestone for you. I would say those have been some of the best, like I walk out of those lunches or those phone calls and just on cloud nine. That's yeah. awesome. Cool. Are these are these legacy brands kind of trapped though, because they have all these relationships through wholesalers and distributors and such. I mean, how do they go direct to consumer without making all those people mad? They, they have a hard time, especially with, as an example, with Nixon, they sold to Billabong. And when Billabong acquired them, they went super wide on their distribution. So they started selling to wholesalers that maybe Nixon wouldn't have otherwise done. Now Nixon is back independent. So it's privately owned or whatever. And they are, I guess, Nixon owns them now. And so now they're trying to narrow their distribution. Well, that's pissing off like to your point, it's pissing off a lot of wholesalers that once had wholesale accounts, but Nixon has to do what's right for their own brand for the long term and stick with their guns. Cause it, it can, you can sacrifice a lot of dollars, piss off a lot of people, but if Nixon's going to last for a hundred years, they got to play it right. And so, yeah, to your point, it, you got to be somewhat a stickler on brand. Yeah. We worked with a few of those brands and some in the skate, you know, and surf space and stuff. And, and it's interesting when they've got such deep roots, you know, in one type of business, but the way of the future is completely different and okay. trying to change perspectives and, change, I mean, really processes and tools. I mean, it's complicated, right? So that's awesome that you guys are able to come in as kind of a disruptor and an innovator in the space. And with some of these brands that you've looked up to and, you know, been a customer of since you were a kid and now be able to sit down and provide value, not just ask questions, but you yeah. know, like you said, kind of give, give, give as much as you can, which is a great approach to, to networking. What about you, Kenzie? What are some of the big milestones that you've seen? I have loved like when we hired our first like graphic designer when we brought Trevor in like a creative director and our he's our chief creative officer like just different hires have been huge like every time we have a new hire it's like oh my gosh the fact that we can pay for their salary and that they're bringing so much value and that like this is a really good symbiotic relationship it's just those things are so cool to me speaking of retail I just had a flashback to one of the Biggest like eye-opening landmark moments for us was when we went out to BYU Hawaii and we were selling at those farmers markets. We were trying to get into a surf shop out there, and we took a lot of our wallets. And they were like, "Ah, oh, maybe we'll do it on consignment. Like, I don't know if these things will sell." And literally, as we were talking to the buyer at the front desk, some random customer we didn't pay her to say anything. <laughs> comes up and she's like, what are these? And we were like, oh, they're thread wallets. Like we just, they're kind of a better rubber band for your cards. And she was like, this is perfect. Like I need this. She ended up buying it. And just, I think that moment was like a landmark moment because it was like, whoa, it was a complete stranger. It wasn't someone at our school who knew us. It wasn't like a friend of a friend. And then it was in that retail space. So it was like, okay, like this does have the chance to become more than us just selling 10 wallets a day. And there's just been, our whole story has been riddled with little moments like that where we just step back and go, holy cow, like that is a landmark. The fact that our production's over in China or that we, just little things. I don't know. I could list so many things, but it's just, there's a lot of awesome opportunities that we've had that have just been moments that we just have to stop and take a second to appreciate because they're so cool. I love it. Those are great great stories. And those, those moments, like, like we said before, those are kind of the, the sparks that keep, keep things going. Right. Cause it's not easy. Right. We can talk all day about all of the, you know, the rainbows and butterflies of entrepreneurships, but there are a lot of tough decisions that have to be made. So again, going back to that gratitude and the hope that that can give you, it's awesome to hear your guys' take yeah. on that and the experience that you've had there. So now you're, you're five and a half years in, you're growing, you're networking with these great brands. You're continuing to see 
big success, but you've also in this time, and again, I want to be respectful of your time. So just as a kind of last, one of the last few things here, you've also started a family in this whole process. And I believe you have a couple of daughters, right? Yes. Yep. We have two daughters, a three-year-old and then a little girl who just turned one. So how has that changed the game and how do you guys manage being partners at a business that's growing fast and requires your attention and leadership while also raising two kids? One of the beauties of COVID that came for me was we didn't have our babysitter able to come. Typically our schedule is Mackenzie comes about halfway through the day and we get a babysitter, but we didn't have that. And so I became the babysitter and so I'd wake up early, work half day, and then she'd come in, we'd switch, and I'd watch the girls. I fell in love with just that uninterrupted time with my girls. And so now I've continued that schedule while we have our office full and we, we have a babysitter again. I've chosen to go home half day on Wednesdays and Fridays just so I can spend time with family, really to make sure I'm living each phase of their life and being present. And so I think it's fortunate enough for us. We have that flexibility in our schedule to do that. And so take advantage of that for me was um, a takeaway from COVID. I've been really just grateful that we can at any point throughout the day or, or year, whatever it is, we can, we can decide to spend time with our family and make sure that they're a priority because it's very easy from an entrepreneurial mind to, and I'm kind of one track minded, I'm ADD. So I it's easy, it could be really easy to just focus on business all the time, which we did early on in our marriage. And, and I don't think it, our marriage suffered at all, but we had to really kind of keep ourselves in check. Like, Hey, are we talking too much business and not enough personal life? You know, but ultimately I think the balance has come finally where we can kind of compartmentalize each aspect of our life from work at an office, not in our home to um, spending time with family, to going on dates, and then, you know, church on weekends. Fortunately, we found some balance. It's a tricky one. And so at points, you have to live with a little bit of imbalance. And it's okay. You know, it's okay to maybe put certain things as priority or have it weigh heavily more in your life at different times. So. Yeah. yeah, I think we've had to learn how to be better communicators. That's a constant battle or struggle thing that we're constantly working on is how to communicate more effectively so that we're in sync, that we are on the same page for the day, the week, the month. And it's, it's hard, but I love that our girls get to see us working together in a unified way on something outside of our family, like that we have commonalities and we love spending time with each other. Like there's so many benefits to working together. And I know it's not for everyone, but it's been a really, really important part of our life and our story. I know that you've got a number of new things in the works. You just released a new product. I think it's a chapstick carrier. Is that right? Kind of with the same, same idea of, of the wallets. And you've got a couple of other cool things coming down the pipeline. So what's next for Thread? I'm really excited. This gets me going. Yeah, the chapstick holder was a home run. We really started to add on these little upsell products. So we've added just like sticker packs and pins, mystery wallets, all that. But as far as hero products, chapstick was the most recent one. And then our next in the works we're launching next week is the crossbody bag. So it's our first step out of the wallet category or at least a bigger category of bags. So that, that launches next week. And then we have a few products in the works. Maybe those ones are more secret, but that one's. <laughs> really yeah. Yes. We'll save that for next time. So the shoulder strap, it's, you said that you get the bag and then you can change out the strap. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so there's so okay. many crossbody bags on the market. They're all, you know, the same, same one, but where we wanted to have expression is when you open the bag, there's um, some polyester that has a print on it, which is really fun. Okay. And then if you want, we, we sell straps separately so you can have, the straps are going to come with it though this time. We'll have, yeah, not in the next two weeks. You won't see those, but within the, probably the next month you'll see, uh, we'll sell straps separately that have like a little bit more expression on the strap itself. Okay. You can buy those. Awesome. So that's all coming down the pipeline in the next month. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. And then any other collaborations coming out? I know that you just did that. Uh, and maybe I, maybe you've done others that I haven't seen, but I saw that, like we talked about that collaborate with low beast in on, on social media. Have yeah, you guys, do you have more of that? Collaboration with the brand Imperial motion. Oh, awesome. They're, that's going to be a fun one coming out in time for the holidays. 
And then we've got a few in the works for next year that, you know, we still have to solidify and stuff, but we've got some fun things coming down the pipeline. Well, Josh, you got any other questions or anything before we wrap it up? One other question I have is, was there any point during your journey, Kenzie and Colby, when you wanted to give up? And if so, what kept you going? That's actually a really good question. I don't think giving up was ever in the cards, but just tough times that, um, like mentioned before, my, my mom's an alcoholic and drug addict. There's been a, a lot of uh, issues with that along the way um, to save some of the details. Basically, she's homeless right now, and she's been homeless a few times where we actually had to just drop her out on the streets. Those emotionally are just, those just wreck you. And being present emotionally, mentally at work is virtually impossible for me during those times. I do my best, but not giving up, like there's no way I could give up. There's so many people who rely on us. It's already caught so much momentum. So that was never a, a question, but definitely like you have to take a pause and, so, and it's okay to say right now is I'm not a hundred percent and I can't go at a hundred percent. If I try to go hundred percent, I might overwhelm myself and, and you know, whatever blow up. So I, you have to kind of pace yourself and realize where you're at emotionally during those crazy times and be okay with not going as fast. And Corey mentioned this too, but starting a business is hard enough. And then starting a marriage and a business together, it just brings up a lot of different things you have to work through. And I'm grateful for it because it's really expedited our learning of how to communicate with each other. But there are, there were very hard moments early on in our marriage and in the business where I didn't want to throw in the towel, but like maybe during those moments of arguing, I was like, I can't do this. Like, there's no way this is going to work out if things don't change. And fortunately they did change. Those are hard moments. And I think anyone would be lying if they said those didn't exist in their life, especially any entrepreneur. And it's okay. I think the scary part for me was I went into marriage thinking that we'll never have an argument. You know, I think one of my buddies said like, I, we've never argued. My wife and I have never argued. And uh, now I can who say says that. I was going to say, seriously, who says that? Literally, I was like, now I could just tell that dude BS. Cause I'm like, <laughs> there's no way. Like maybe you define argument differently, but like for sure you've had arguments. I just had this like expectation early on that I didn't want to have arguments, whatever. And I've come to realize that like arguments are okay as long as you learn from them and deal with them right. And I think we have, but it was, it was kind of, my world was shook for a little bit there at the beginning. So what pulled you through that? What kept you going? Was there kind of a thread you were able to grab onto that kind of pulled you through these times? I think at the end of the day, realizing that we're like remembering and reminding each other that we're on the same team, that we're working towards the same goals. Like sometimes I'm very stubborn. Colby's very independent. Like our, we're both um, kind of have hard heads. Like we're both, we want to do our own thing. So sometimes that in and of itself creates conflict with how we want to handle certain situations, but just reminding each other that we're on the same team, that we have the same goals that like, we're not trying to prove that one's better than the other or a point that one of us is trying to make is better than the other. I think that yeah, just those little reminders that, Hey, we're on the same team. We've got this like, let's come together and figure this out. Like having that overarching goal is what helps us at the end of the day. Yeah, Josh, from the marriage standpoint, it goes back to Corey's, uh, the seven habits of a highly effective people of just seeking for understanding first before you make any assumptions and then seek to be understood after that, that has helped our marriage. And when we do that, we're, it's, it's great. It's uh, smooth sailing on the side with my mom. I think that, just really results in um, prayer and just being able to let go because by nature I'm a problem solver. And so it's frustrated me to no end on not being able to solve this problem of my mom's addiction. And the moment that I realized I have zero control of this situation, that there's nothing I can do personally anymore to, to help with her addiction and recovery that when I can accept that and that helps me move forward because if I don't accept that, then I just beat myself to death. Do you think that helps you as a parent? Does it help you? Does it change your perspective on, on, you know, being a parent and a husband seeing, seeing your mom 
in that sense. Absolutely. I mean, in short, absolutely. My kids are so young at this point, so ask me when they're teenagers. But <laughs> yeah. they're, uh, yeah, as of right now, my mindset, I think, through this this trial of my whole life, 20, 30 years of an addiction, learning from that and finally accepting that I don't have control, I think that's going to help big time with marriage and with um, parenting. Man, uh, that's huge. Just the, it can be a person, obviously you don't have control over another individual and the decisions they make, but there's a lot of other things that are outside of control, right? That, that you can stress about and let get you wound up and let, but really what's the point? And again, I've seen that exact same scenario play out in my own life. So I, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. And it does give you perspective though. It gives you a completely new perspective on how valuable every single day is with your family and your kids that's irreplaceable. People have asked me a lot in my life, you know, the effects that, that some of those personal family trials have had on me. And, and, you know, you can talk about the negatives for all day, but, but there's just so much perspective that you get from that, that you just wouldn't get otherwise. And so again, focusing back on that gratitude, I think that process of, of finding gratitude and all of those, even the trials and the tough things can give you, give you that hope for, for the future. Right. So that's a perfect example that I appreciate you sharing that opening up about it. Thanks Corey. Well, Colby and Mackenzie, we really, really appreciate you. It's been so fun for me, you know, to see from those early Instagram posts with some of the, you know, the same people that we know where it was like, oh, that's cool. Oh, I didn't know Mackenzie was doing that. Oh, she married this cool dude, you know, like kind of walking <laughs> through this whole process and seeing the growth and having had the opportunity, you know, on, our, on the agency side to work with you a little bit. And, you know, it, it's, it's so rewarding to watch good people uh, achieve great things. So props to you guys for the motivations behind all of this and for the hard work that's gone into it. And we wish nothing but continued success for you guys and your families Thanks. and thread as it continues to dominate. Thanks. Corey. Well, we really appreciate it. Well, best of luck to MWI with all you guys are doing and yeah. this podcast is so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much guys. We appreciate it, but thank you. We will talk to you soon. If you need anything in the meantime, let us know guys. Good talking to you. Hello, it's Corey here, and I just want to thank you so much for listening into the Hope Strategy Podcast. I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are enjoying having these amazing conversations with these incredible individuals talking about hope. We'd love it if you wouldn't mind liking, subscribing, and leaving us a review on iTunes or Spotify or anywhere that you listen to your podcasts and share it with anybody you feel that can benefit from these messages of hope. Thank you so much for listening to the Hope Strategy Podcast.